Ben Hall, stockman, squatter, bushranger. From these personas, his character has still remained an enigma. From a man held in high regard by all who knew him, to a man through his own actions became one of the most hunted in colonial history, and who would ultimately die a violent and bloody death at the hands of his pursuers. A close friend of him wrote at the time, he was one of the smart, devil-may-care bushmen, who knew the country well, always had a good horse, and knew how to ride. He was a good mate at mustering cattle or running wild horses. He could mother a calf. That means, after a day's mustering, he could tell you, when drafting next day, which calf belonged to which cow, even if there are a hundred different brands. Ernest Bowler a female hostage of Halls in one of his last acts as a bush ranger recounted this after his demise. He was a splendid rider and a good stockman, one of the best around. He was a well-built, good-looking young man with a pleasant disposition which gained him the friendship of all with whom he came into contact with. Elizabeth Ferran Ben Hall was born in early 1837 in the Maitland district near Newcastle, the third of nine children. During Ben's early life, his family moved to the Pages River area at Murrurundi. His father developed a reputation for cattle duffing and horse stealing. It was here that Ben learnt the bushcraft that unknowingly would become so valuable to him in the future as he would have assisted his siblings in the nature of his father's dubious work. The country around Murrurundi district was still wild and unknown, and the whole children would soon learn the layout of the countryside and the hidden valleys and gullies. Soon, the area became too risky for his father, and in 1849 with his family, Ben Hall Senior moved to the Lachlan district near Karkor. But they soon returned to Murrurundi, and young Ben Hall remained behind and commenced working as a stockman on various cattle stations. When young Ben was working on Boyd Station, he was attempting to break in a rough horse from which he suffered a bad kick, which broke his leg. His injury was reset by Mrs Strickland on nearby Bundaburra Station. This injury was to leave him lame in one leg for the rest of his life. Ben Hall developed a strong reputation as a reliable and diligent worker. Ben soon fell for the young Bridget Walsh, who was 16 years of age, and on the 29th of February 1856, Ben Hall and Bridget Walsh married at St Michael's Catholic Church, Bathurst. After three years of marriage, their only child Henry was born on the 7th of August 1859 at the homestead of his close friend Daniel Charters at Carcor. Ben Hall was becoming a man of moderate means when he and his brother-in-law, John Maguire, applied for and were granted the leasehold of Sandy Creek Station, an area of 16,000 acres in March 1860. As John Maguire wrote of Ben and Biddy's marriage, the young couple jogged along very happily for a few years until a sneak of a fellow named Jim Taylor, a married man himself, upset the happy home. Ben soon became aware of Taylor's true intentions. Hall cautioned his wife, but the threat was to fall on deaf ears as whilst Ben was away mustering, Taylor struck, and Bridget eloped with him, taking Ben's young son with her. According to Maguire, Hall was wild with anger at the betrayal and searched the district for a number of days with no luck. He returned to Sandy Creek, but his desire for a better life for him and his family was dashed. He soon became disinterested in work and even talked of getting even with Taylor and learned for the first time the mechanisms of a revolver, passing the days shooting imaginary Taylors. Ben Hall, as with most who lived in the Wedden Mountains area, knew Frank Gardner. Frank Gardner was spending a lot of time around the Sandy Creek area between robberies. 
Garda's presence soon started to have an influence on the angry and despondent Ben Hall. Before long, Hall was drawn into one of Gardner's hold-ups, either by design or accident, when Gardner in April 1862 held up the bullock dray of a contracted carrier named Bacon. As Gardner conducted the business of sticking up, Hall and another man named Youngman participated in the activities. On completion, they departed separately. Two weeks later, at a horse race meeting in Forbes, Sir Frederick Pottinger, on information he had, arrested Hall for his part in the dray holder. Hall claimed ignorance in the affair, but there was sufficient evidence to commit him for trial and he was transported to Orange. Maguire, the trusted partner, arrived with funds for legal counsel, and it is widely believed tampered with a witness, whose testimony created a reasonable doubt for the jury and as such, Ben Hall was acquitted. His farm falling into neglect, the arrest by Pottinger, who was relentless in harassing anyone who may have been involved with his nemesis, Frank Gardner, Hall soon came under the scrutiny of the law. Gardner soon devised a bold plan to attack one of the gold escorts. With the help of his lieutenant, John Gilbert, Gardner soon put a band together for that purpose and the Yugao escort was to be the target. His recruits for this enterprise consisted of himself, John Gilbert, John Bow, Alex Fordyce, Henry Manns, John O'Mealy, Ben Hall and Daniel Charters. The success of the robbery sent shockwaves through the colony and great pressure was placed on the police for arrests. Before long, the rounding up of suspects was soon in earnest, including Ben Hall and John O'Mealy, and Daniel Charters. Charters, in fear for his life and pressure from his devoted sisters, turned Queen's evidence on the promise of a full pardon for information leading to the arrest of the gang members. He soon revealed the participants, but denied Ben Hall, John O'Mealy were involved in the holdup. As a result, Ben Hall was once more released. By the beginning of 1863, Ben Hall had finally taken the plunge and commenced bush ranging. He was now participating in holdups with Gardner and Gilbert and would become part of and eventually lead one of the most active and creative gangs in colonial history for armed robbery, kidnapping, murder, horse stealing and intimidation. Soon, the pressure on Gardner was great and he fled New South Wales for Queensland. Ben Hall, Gilbert and O'Mealy then took control of the roads and tracks between Forbes, Orange, Bathurst, Goulburn, Gundagai and all settlements in between. With their intimate knowledge of the surrounding country, outstanding bushcraft and superb horsemanship, they were on many occasions able to make the police and the government of the day look inept in the pursuit of them. The bush rangers continued to blaze a trail across the western districts, often in sight of their pursuing police. With well-placed bush telegraphs, the gang operated as they pleased, almost gaining in today's parlance, rock star status. By the end of August 1863, Ben Hall had recruited two new members to the gang, Mickey Burke, 21, and John Vane, 22. The gang, fearing no one, soon started to enter townships and with good information knew the movements of the police. By the end of September, Canoundra soon came under the occupation of the gang. The hamlet of Canoundra consisted of about 50 residents, a lone constable, two hotels, a store, post office, blacksmith and saddler's shop, and a dozen homes. The bush rangers swept into the town on Sunday evening. At about six o'clock, they tied up their horses and commenced searching every house and person for cash, but obtained a very limited amount. They took from the only stores in town about 30 pounds worth of men's clothing and three pounds in cash, after which they adjourned to Robertson's Hotel inviting all residents to have a dance, for which Gilbert paid, tea being first ordered. The landlord and his wife had departed that morning for Bathurst, leaving only his sister and the two Miss Flanagans in charge of the hotel. After the tea things were cleared away, 
Gilbert, very politely, requested one of the young ladies to play him a tune on the piano. A short time after, a dance was proposed and commenced about nine o'clock and continued until daylight the next morning. It was decided that Burke and O'Mealy should receive any company that might arrive in the town during the evening. At 11 o'clock, the citizens numbered 18 and the numbers were not augmented after that hour at the dance. Gilbert and his companions called and paid for all they drank during the night and the night's entertainment is spoken of as one of the jolliest affairs that have ever taken place in that small hamlet. Not a low or improper word being spoken by the gang. Gilbert kept the company in roars of laughter with his accounts of the police, whom he designated as a lot of cowards, and said that when he left Rotheries, he mentioned where he was going, so that it might be relayed to the police, knowing full well that they would not reach Canoundra until they had left. The bush rangers left Robertson's at five o'clock in the morning and retired to a paddock opposite where they had two hours sleep and left the hamlet unmolested at eight o'clock in the morning. Before leaving Canoundra, Amelie visited with some of his admiring relatives about three or four miles off and was most cordially received by them. After the first raid on Canoundra, the bush rangers raided the hub of the western district, Bathurst, but they soon returned to Canoundra. This time they came for a longer, jollier affair. Once more, the bush rangers swept into town early on Monday morning, the 12th of October, paying a visit to Mr. Robertson's hotel and taking from him about three pounds. After this, some of the gang were placed so as to guard the approaches to the town, and everyone who made his appearance was taken into custody and brought to the hotel, where they were told they must remain, but that they might call for whatever they liked at the bush rangers' expense. No restraint was imposed upon the residents other than that they were ordered not to quit the town. The bush rangers amusing themselves in a variety of ways, holding a so-called robber's jubilee. On Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock, three more travellers arrived at Robinson's Hotel, where Ben Hall informed them that he was sorry to inconvenience them, but they really could not be permitted to proceed on their journey, and must therefore trouble them to leave their vehicle and put up for a while. On getting out, Amelie, who was present, saw a revolver in one of the gentlemen's possession, and presenting one of his own weapons at his head, compelled him to give it up, remarking that they did not require it, but as it might be used against them, it was as well to take the precaution of keeping it out of harm's way. This and the robbery of the three pounds was the only items of violence committed during their stay. A first class dinner was ordered and the cost of this as well as everything else called for was defrayed by the gang. Every dray and team that passed was stopped and the men belonging to them were lodged, fed and supplied with drink free of expense. There were 12 or 14 drays drawn up in a line and not the slightest attempt was made to interfere with the loading that they contained. Bundles of cigars, purchased by Gilbert, as required, were thrown loosely on one of the tables in the public house for all who cared about smoking them, and a huge pile of sweet meats was also provided to suit the taste of the others. Everyone was empowered to call for what he liked. The bush rangers drank nothing but bottled ale and porter, the corks of which they insisted upon being drawn in their presence. Great festivities were kept up, and from the description given of the gang, they entertained not the slightest apprehension of being disturbed, and did not seem to think they were incurring any risk. Amongst a variety of amusements, shooting at a target seemed to be the favourite, and nothing occurred to mar the revels except the accidental dropping of a carbine which went off and sent its contents flying past O'Mealy's legs. Some of the residents in the neighbourhood desired to visit their homes and a leave of absence of an hour's duration was granted, passes being given to them duly signed by the gang. In one or two instances where the time allowed was exceeded by the pass holder, Ben Hall went after them, but on meeting the individuals returning, he contented himself with admonishing them for their transgressions. Ben Hall said he must go and look after the local policeman and getting on his horse he rode up to the barracks. Hall drove the captured constable before his horse down to the hotel 
where the gang amused themselves with him for a short while, and after taking his arms away, told him to go in and enjoy himself till he received further orders. There were about 40 persons detained altogether. The gang recounted several of their exploits and expressed a lively contempt for the policemen generally, and for their officers in particular, saying that when the police came, all they had to do was ride away. Finally, the gang rode out after their three-day jubilee at four o'clock on Wednesday afternoon, leaving the press to once more lampoon the police. After the festivities, an observer expressed this opinion of the gang. Gilbert is a very jolly fellow, of slight build and thin, always laughing. Amelia is said by everyone to be a murderous looking scoundrel. Van Hall is a quiet, good looking fellow, lame in one leg, having been broken. He is the eldest of the party and the leader, I fancy about 28 years of age. Vane is a big sleepy looking man, upwards of 12 stone, and Mickey Burke is small. They seem at all times to be the most thoroughly self-possessed and to understand each other, and being sober men are not likely to quarrel. They appear to be always talking of their exploits and of the different temperaments of the people they bail up. After their stint at Canandra, they crossed the Balubula River, where Vane almost drowned, but before long, Mickey Burke would be shot at the Keatleys and die by his own hand, followed soon after by Vane's surrender to the police. John O'Mealy would be shot dead at Campbell's property, Goimblia, and Gilbert and Hall continued on and soon recruited a new member, John Dunn. But time and the law were fast approaching, and the new Felons Act was soon to be law. The gang split at the end of April 1865 and planned to rejoin a few days into May. And on the 5th of May 1865, police and black trackers, after an informant's treachery, found Hall and he was shot dead, riddled with bullets. Within a few days, Gilbert and Dunn were also betrayed for the substantial reward, with Gilbert shot dead at Minalong and Dunn eventually captured and hung at Darlinghurst in 1866, thus ending one of the most effective bushranger gangs in colonial history. Thank you.